This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www.emeraldashborer.info website. Thank you for attending today, everyone. And Julie, you can start your presentation. All right, thanks, Robin. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, so for those of you who know all about EAB or even the early stages of the biocontrol program, I, I am gonna apologize up front. I really feel that to do a thorough job for those people who are joining us for the first time, I really do need to be thorough and cover that in my talk. So hopefully it will be informative and you know, if you want to wait for the biocontrol part, that is absolutely coming um, in the second, probably two thirds of my talk. Um, so as many of you know, EAB was found feeding on ash in southeastern Michigan in 2002, thought to have been introduced from China in um, solid wood packing material up to 10 years before it was discovered. Um, and it's not the adults that do the damage. The adults are small. They feed on foliage um, high up in the canopy. We don't really notice them. Um, and they, they emerge in the spring, depending, you know, further south, they emerge sooner than they do up in the north. But they, they mate, they lay eggs between bark crevices. And it's the larvae that are the damaging stage. And this life cycle is actually going to um, be important in my talk later on. And that is, this is a one year life cycle and many EAB do have one generation per year. They become larvae in late summer and then they enter what's called the J larval stage and they go into these in overwintering chambers and then they come out the following spring. But many of the larvae um, for whatever reason, whether the eggs were laid late or they, it was a cold summer or it's just very far north, many of the larvae in the more northern parts of the country will actually take two years to develop. And that is actually very important to the success of biocontrol. And I'll talk about that later in my talk. So as I said, it's the larvae that are damaging and they produce galleries that cut off the flow of nutrients up and down the tree, eventually girdling branches and killing entire trees. And hundreds of millions of trees have died and there are extensive economic and environmental losses due to emerald ash borer. Um, there's just the ecological losses, even though ash is only about 2% of the um, basal area of, of trees in this country, where it is present, it's often very common, especially in riparian areas. You can see at this river bank, just the absolute devastation of this little forest patch uh, to EAB with all those dead ashes. Um, ash is a very important street tree. You can imagine the amount of um, money that would be used, needed to cut down all these dead ash trees along this just one street. I think this is in Ohio. So very costly to remove the trees. And then the neighborhood is very, very different once these trees are gone. And of course, you know, we make things out of ash wood. Um, it's, bucket handles and, and, and baseball bats. So it's also an important wood. And ash also has cultural significance for native peoples who um, both need it economically and culturally, and they make these beautiful ash bark baskets. As I said, it's estimated that about 2% of the country's leaf area is ash, but on a lo more local level, it can be much, uh, much more dense. Um, at the beginning of the Emerald Ash Borer program, it was costing th about 30 million a year to try and manage um, Emerald Ash Borer. And it was estimated that there would be 50 to $60 billion in related economic losses and also 282 billion losses in timberland. So quite a significant pest. Um, initially, um, the many control strategies were tried Chemical control is actually, as we know, very effective, but only on an individual tree level. It's hard to treat an entire forest uh, using trunk injections. Um, the APHIS PPQ tried to set up what they called these marshalling yards and all these infested ash trees would go there and get chipped up to destroy the emerald ash borer. And regulations were put in, in place to try to keep people from moving ash products like firewood and nursery stock. Um, but sadly, um, 
EAB was really good at moving around. In the early days of my working with this project, I literally would go to a campground if I wanted to find EAB because that's chances are that's where EAB would be found. Um, so the strategies I mentioned were not successful in stopping the spread of EAB throughout the US. Um, and even though regulations were in place, they were put in place quarantines and they were meant to slow the spread of EAB, eventually the EAB infestation just became way too widespread and inf resources were too scarce to keep up. And APHIS stopped regulating EAB as of January 2001. Um, and it seems like every time I give this talk, I have to come up with a new map uh, showing the known infestation of EAB. Um, you can see the star in the set in the over Detroit, Michigan. That's where the EAB was first found, and it's now um, spread throughout most of the eastern the part of the country east of the Rockies. But as of last year, you see the red dot up in the corner in, near Portland, Oregon. EAB has jumped the continental divide and is now has a population up in Oregon. So it's it's continuing to move and to be a great problem. I'm going to switch a little and talk about what I do, which is classical biological control, because we were not we are not going to eradicate EAB and a lot of the other methods don't work very well in particular because we don't have a wonderful way to trap or monitor for this pest. Um, so I, I've been working on classical biological control most of my career, and that is the importation of specialist natural enemies for sustained control of a previously introduced pest. And there are a lot of benefits to classical biocontrol. It can be very specific, unlike some pesticides and herbicides. Once the insects are established, you hope they are self-sustaining and no longer need input from people. In the long run, it's cost effective and it can be very, very effective. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about some examples of that. But there, of course, are risks and disadvantages of classical biocontrol. Um, we definitely want to look for non-target effects. Is it uh, attacking any insects that are important in the United States that are native here? Um, some Insects have negative impacts on humans. There's a multi, um, I think it's multicolored Asian lady beetle that was introduced to attack aphids and they congregate in houses in the winter and there's actually a lot of people that are allergic to them and cause severe allergies. One th other thing about biocontrol, it's not easy or quick to implement. <clears throat> it never will completely eliminate the pest and the upfront cost can be considerable. So because of these disadvantages, we need to make sure that there's a high probability of success before we could, uh, pursue the development of a biocontrol project. And the very first biocontrol project in the United States that was classical biocontrol was against the cottony cushion scale, uh, which can be seen in this picture. It's those, those white things on a citrus tree. And it almost destroyed the California citrus industry in the late 1800s. Um, a beetle called the Vidalia beetle and a parasitoid were introduced and they literally saved the California citrus industry. And since uh, 1889 and that successful project, there have been over 5,000 uh, introductions of biocontrol agents against arthropod pests worldwide. Another really important success story was the cassava mealybug. Cassava is native to South America, but it's grown extensively in Africa. Up to 70% of the calor calories that some Africans ingest in a day uh, are made up of cassava. But in the 1970s, this cassava mealybug was introduced, and in some areas there was up to 80% cr uh, crop loss. Um, Scientists went to South America and found a host specific parasitoid that was introduced and really saved the cassava crop in Africa. And it was estimated at the time that the benefit cost ratio was 500 to one. And of course the benefits just keep accruing because the parasitoid keeps working. And as Robin mentioned, I, my, I was very, very lucky my very first biocontrol, classical biocontrol project was against ash whitefly and it was a resounding success. It was introduced into California in the late 1980s 
and was a significant pest of fruit and shade trees. You can see all the honeydew and sooty mold that are all over these leaves. Um, and the pest population exploded in the uh, absence of natural enemies. But this whitefly was not a pest in its native range. It was rarely ever mentioned in the literature. And foreign exploration um, led to the finding of a small wasp. And 30 years later, it's still keeping ash whitefly under control. So worldwide, about 16% of biocontrol projects have um, exhibited complete control, 42% partial control. But a lot of these projects failed because they were too limited in duration and resources. Other, others do fail sometimes, even after concerted efforts. But even so, the, it's been estimated that the cost ratios, the benefit cost ratios range from 3.1 to over 100.1, and the benefits continue to accrue. Um, someone in Australia did an estimate, and they found that the benefit cost ratios for biocontrol was about 10.6 to 1 compared with 2.5 to 1 for pesticides. And that's even including the projects that don't, don't work. So overall, it's considered that the benefits from successful projects do outweigh the combined costs of unsuccessful projects. And it's always worth uh, considering this as a management tool. So when do we want to pursue biocontrol? Um, when a species is non-native, has been established for at least five years, is causing economic or ecological damage, and eradication is not possible. And of course, we check all these boxes for emerald ash borer. And I'm going to switch gears now and talk specifically about the pest that I've been working on for the past 20 years, the emerald ash borer. So what have we been doing for the past 20 years? Um, well, we start at the beginning. The very first step is to study the biology of the pest itself. Oftentimes, pests that are invasive in other countries are not well known in their country of origin because they're kept under control by either um, host plant resistance or by biocontrol. So we need to study the biology of the pest to understand it better. Then. We need to look for native natural enemies. Are there natural enemies in the country of invasion that might attack the pest and do some good? If so, you don't need biocontrol. If you decide to move forward with biocontrol, we then do foreign exploration. Once you find a suite of natural enemies, you need to study them and see which ones are appropriate uh, to use as biocontrol agents. Then you import them into um, the country of invasion and do what's called host specificity testing, looking at non-target insects that are in, native to the United States that might be attacked by, by, the, um, by the natural enemy. You then have to do a lot of paperwork, preparing release justification documents, requesting and receiving permits, and then finally, you can get going with doing the actual work of starting a biocontrol program, finding field sites, developing mass rearing techniques, and releasing. Um, and once you do all that, you need to evaluate the efficacy and study the impact on non-targets. You need to make sure that what you, what you undertook is actually working. So we'll go through that. And that's, again, the last 20 years of my life has been devoted to this. And so first step was to look uh, for native, for natural enemies uh, that might be attacking EAB that were already native to the US. Um, there were a few and we can still con continue to find them. Uh, but at the time, parasitism was less than 1%. Um, the insect on the upper right, which is an Atanacola species, it's too bad this picture doesn't have, they have a beautiful red abdomen. Um, they have been found to cause considerable parasitism when EAB densities are really high, but that's not an ideal biocontrol agent. You want something that's going to attack EAB when densities are low to keep it that way. So we started surveying uh, for natural enemies in China in 2003 to 2007, um, mostly in northeastern China. Uh, these are some of the uh, cooperators that we had in China. And we did find some natural enemies that were promising. Uh, one was Tetrasticus planipanisi, which is a small parasitoid in the family Eulophidae. 
it actually is an internal parasitoid. It, it, it drills through the bark and inside of the EAB and lays its eggs inside the larva. Um, I don't know, on the top picture, if you can see, look carefully, you can see these little things that look like little grains of rice. Those are parasitoid larvae. And there are multiple parasitoids. There are up to a hundred of these little parasitoids inside a big EAB larva. And um, they then emerge from the EAB and they will come out and they will have up to four generations per year on the same, pop on the same population of EAB. So while EAB is having one generation a year, these things will have four. So they looked very promising. Uh, there was another what we call gregarious parasitoid, one that lays more than one egg on an EAB. And this was Spathius agrilli. It was found in Tianjin, China. And instead of being an internal parasitoid, it lays its eggs external to the EAB on the outside. And it, it lays up to 20, whereas, you know, Tetrasticus was up to 100. It lays between 8 and 20 eggs. Um, and then these larvae feed external to the EAB. And they then produce cocoons. And again, they will also go through several generations per year. And another promising parasitoid was Oobius agrilli. It's an egg parasitoid, very, very tiny. I've always been very grateful this hasn't been my main focus because I can't, can't see them. They're so, so tiny. Um, you know, the egg of the EAB is less than, a, is about a millimeter long. So these parasitoids are even smaller. Um, but they also will um, have two gen, up to two generations per year on EAB eggs. Uh, one final parasitoid that we found was called Sclerodermis puperii, and we actually ended up not considering this as a potential biocontrol agent for the following reasons. Uh, for one thing, parasitism levels were low, which was not encouraging. A high proportion of the females are wingless. You can see this is a female, but she has no wings. Therefore, dispersal of this biocontrol agent wouldn't be very good. Uh, members of the genus have been known to sting people, which would be a PR nightmare if we released it and that were the case. So we didn't consider this. Um, again, you want to make sure that anything you select is going to have a high probability of success. So we did a lot of host specificity testing in the laboratory, testing things like bronze birch borer, two-line chestnut borer, um, things that are closely related or in the genus Agrilus. And we got a lot of um, good information um, about it. We also did testing in the native range. We found that we never found either Tetrasticus or Spathius attacking any other Agrilus in China. So it was decided in 2007 that we would apply for permits to release these biocontrol agents. And we had to go through, as you can see, a lot of regulatory steps, fill out a lot of paperwork. But we, we did it, and we got permission to do releases. The federal permit was um, issued in July of 2007. And I'd like to emphasize how fast that actually was. EAB was found in 2002, and we were releasing parasitoids in 2007, which is just warp speed in terms of biocontrol projects. So, okay, so we have these parasitoids. How do we rear them in enormous numbers to get them out in the field? Well, you have a challenge, of course, because EAB is growing underneath the bark of a tree. How do you do that in a laboratory setting? Um, well, so our, we came up with methods, and the first um, method was we would go out in the field and collect lots of logs that contained a, a, a pupae of EAB and we would keep them cold until we needed them. And then we'd warm them up in these cardboard tubes and collect adults. The adults were then reared on ash foliage. And during the winter, we would actually have tropical ash foliage sent to us from Puerto Rico and Hawaii so that we could rear all year round. Um, and we had these little grip jars, which we call condos. And we had filter paper, like um, coffee filters. Um, and screening on the top. And the EAB love to lay their eggs underneath this coffee filter. You can see the, um, the lid on the right has a ring of eggs around the edge. And those papers could then be affixed on the side of a log. 
and we kept the logs moist and the EAB larvae would actually develop normally in these logs. So we took either the egg papers or the logs and we put them in cups in the lab and uh, put the parasitoids in the cups and the parasitoids would um, readily uh, parasitize them. And these, the method of using these logs actually became our release method because originally we were just releasing parasitoid adults and they would, they're attracted to light. They would say, oh, look at the light and they would just disappear. But we revised our methods to put the egg papers with parasitized um, EAB eggs in these little pill jars. These are affectionately called oobinators. And or we would just hang logs that had pu pupae of the parasitoids out in the field. And, and we would let everything emerge um, naturally. And I think this really helped our release um, technology. Um, and you can see that when we started in 2009, we were not rearing very many parasitoids and we built up to considerable numbers. By 2015, the rearing facility was rearing almost a million tetrasticus um, to ship out for release. And the number of tetrasticus has come down over the years, but the reason for that is we've been rearing other things. We've been rearing more oobius, and then we got Spathius galeni, which I'll talk about in a bit. And so, in fact, because you can only rear one oobius out of an EAB if you put that EAB into egg production and produce oobius, whereas you can really, you know, rear 50 to 100 tetrasticus. <clears throat> so that it, that's why the number of tetrasticus came down um, over the years. We've now released parasitoids in 30 of the um, infested states. Um, all the and I think it's probably even more because this one doesn't even show Maine. We have released and recovered in Maine uh, and we've released clear and recovered parasitoids clear out in Colorado as well. So we've released a lot of parasitoids. So we release the parasitoids, now what? Did, are they doing any good? Are they establishing? Are they moving? And so the rest of my talk is gonna talk about the research that scientists have been doing to evaluate the success of this program. Um, and so the first thing, the first question you have to ask is, are the insects reproducing in the field? And if they do, are they establishing? Are they there for a couple of years? Are they moving? Are, are they going beyond the release site to follow EAB populations as the EAB moves? Um, are they having any effect on the density of EAB? And what about ash? The ultimate goal is to have ash survive as a viable component of American forests. Are, are we having that? Are we meeting that goal? And then finally, um, can we integrate uh, biocontrol with other management techniques? So the rest of my talk will be about the research we've been doing um, evaluating the success of EAB biocontrol. Um, we have developed um, many different methods to, um, to sample for EAB. We've put bark and logs in tubes and emerge the adults. We scrape the bark to look for oobius. Um, that's a very tedious job. Uh, we put out these yellow pan traps, which are very attractive to all three of the um, biocontrol agents. And we also, if we want to know parasitism levels, then we have to debark the tree and peel it. Um, so let's start with recovery. Step number one, we have indeed recovered these parasitoids. We've recovered oobius in 17 states, Spathius agrilli in nine, Spathius galeni in 13, and Tetrasticus planipanesi in 20 for a total of at least one parasitoid species has been recovered in 23 states. Sadly though, recovery does not equal establishment. Uh, our definition of establishment is recovery up to two years later, which is about four genera eight generations after release. And the problem is Spathius agrilla so far has never actually established. It has been recovered, it has overwintered, but it hasn't been found subsequently. So why? Um, well, one of the things we did was we found that Tetrasticus and Oobius are establishing and dispersing really well in the north. Um, but we know that Spathius grilli, even though it can overwinter, it doesn't persist. And 
we did some climate matching models and we showed that Tianjin, China, where Spathius agrilli was found, is more similar to the southeastern New York, not to the northern part of the, of, of the country. And so the EAB biocontrol program actually decided to conserve its resources and release Spathius agrilli only south of the 40th parallel. But that leads us to a problem up north because Tetrasicus is doing great, it's establishing, but it has a really short ovipositor and it's restricted to small diameter ash trees and branches. So um, fortunately though, uh, we found another Spathius species. I've kind of hinted at this. It's called Spathius galini because we really need a, 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 spath a parasitoid with a long ovipositor. As these, as EAB comes into a site, it kills the big trees. Tetrasticus can work in the small trees, but as the trees get bigger and the site recovers, we need something with a long ovipositor. Well, Spathius agrilli was found in Vladivostok, Russia, where the climate is more similar to the northern United States. It was found to be very species specific. And it got the release petition got a unanimous support, and we were able to start releases in 2015. Um, oh, and uh, I did not update this slide. It has now been found in many more. I think it's up to nine um, nine different states rather than five. So we're we're just starting to get it released, but it's establishing quite well. And. We have found that these different species have different environmental requirements. Um, as I said, Tetrasticus and Spathius galini establish much better in the north. And we did a very large study looking at, um, at how EAB overwintered throughout the country. And what we found was, is that the further north you go, the more likely you are to have a two-year life cycle. And you have to have a two-year life cycle for Tetrasticus and Spathius galini. Both of these parasitoids come out very early in the spring. And if EAB is in an overwintering chamber in the middle of the tree, these parasitoids are not going to be able to reach it. So the further south you go, the more likely the EAB is to make it to the overwintering chamber and the less likely you are that your parasitoids are going to get established. And the data from this study actually helped the rearing facility determine where to prioritize the release of these different larval parasitoids. And it's not doing it based on the 40th parallel, which was our first guess, but it's actually based on the number of degree days accumulated during the summer. Um, Oobius also has been found to have specific di diapause requirements in, in terms of the day length. Diapause is when the insects stop developing. And so it too um, can establish better in different, um, at different latitudes where there are different day lengths. Um, and Toby Patrice with the Forest Service is working on getting this figured out. So, we have a good handle on establishment of the insects and where they can establish. Now let's talk about dispersal. Um, you need an insect that's going to move around and it's going to follow the host as the host moves. And what this shows is this is um, a 2013 to 2017 series of maps of what we called a greenway. This was actually an old um, boat canal that now has a bike path next to it. And this is going through in Roche near Rochester, New York. And we decided we wanted to find a linear path of ash and follow the EAB and the parasitoids down this path. And so we put a yellow pan trap uh, which is one of our collection methods, every 50 feet along this, um, or fi excuse me, every 50 meters along this, um, this path. And so in 2013, we released at release sites one, two, and three, those are the yellow triangles. And we did not recover any parasitoids in our yellow pan traps, but you can see that most of the EAB that we got in our yellow pan traps are north of yellow pan trap or, or north of release site two. 
by the following year, lots more EAB. Um, and the EAB are starting to move south. And we are also picking up the parasitoids. And the parasitoids are also starting on that southward trajectory. 2015, the EAB is again moving south. There are the parasitoids. Um, in 2016, we took off our the 250 meters at the north end because most of the trees were dead. But you can see that even down in the very southern part of where we were sampling, we have a couple of traps that have EAB and there is Tetrasticus with them. So EAB was moving south and Tetrasticus was right on its heels. They have a very good uh, ability to track their host. Um, we also know from other studies um, done in New York that Spathius galeni also disperses very well. Within a few years, it was found 14 kilometers away from a release site. And it had actually surprisingly shown up eight kilometers away across the Hudson River after a few years. We had some sites where we never released it and all of a sudden it showed up and it must have come from those release sites across the Hudson River. Um, Oobius also does disperse. It has been found at control sites a kilometer from the release site within a few years, but it is tiny and it um, moves more slowly and it's also much more hard, more difficult to track. So what about reduction in EAB density? Um, my colleague Jian Duan with ARS um, has has some long-term um, study plots in New York, excuse me, in Michigan, and um, has found that between 2008, when they started releasing Tetrasticus, and 2014, when the study ended, the density of EAB <coughs> declined precipitously to probably around five per meter squared, which was down from a peak of about 45 per meter squared. And during that period of time, the parasitism rate by Tetrasticus was increasing. So we absolutely are getting collapses in EAB density. We, we find parasitism rising. But the problem is that even though we released parasitoids in these sites, the mature ash trees still died. And the problem, of course, is that we're releasing a couple thousand parasitoids against millions of EAB, and we cannot prevent the mortality of mature ash trees by doing biocontrol. Therefore, the future of ash is a viable component of, North Amer of ash in North American forests depends on the survival of the saplings that are present following the initial outbreak. And I conducted a study in New York, and my colleague Jian did one in Michigan, looking at EAB mortality in ash saplings. And we found that it was incredibly high. Um, EAB density had declined and parasitism increased. Most of the saplings in the area were uninfested, but those EAB larvae that were there were being killed by either Tetrasticus planipanesi or the native woodpeckers. In fact, in one of my, uh, I had six sites in Eastern New York and we were sampling 120 saplings at these sites and there were zero live EAB in the fourth instar. They had all been killed by Tetrasticus or woodpeckers. It was quite something. So, um, so how are we doing with Spathius galeni? Um, these are some sites that Gian was working in in Connecticut, Massachusetts and New York. And between 2015, when they started parasitoid releases, and 2020, um, the density of EAB, again, declined to less than 10 per meter squared. And the parasitism of Spathius galeni was very high. It was you know, around 60, 70, per 80 percent, um, which is actually even higher than uh, we often see for Tetrasticus. So Spathius galeni is also quite capable of causing a lot of mortality of EAB. So finally, we get to the survival and regeneration of ash because that's the ultimate goal. And of course, we're still, we're 20 years into the entire project. Releases have only been really going strong for 10 years. So it's very, very early 
to be talking about regeneration of ash, but we certainly do have some data on this um, that I'll share with you. Um, in the sites I was working with in uh, New York, we found a very clear relationship between the size or DBH of the ash tree and the probability that it would die with the bigger trees being much, much more likely to die than the, than the smaller saplings. And you can ignore the release and control other than to say our releases did not save any trees, they still died. Um, and this is a graph showing the crown class with a crown class of one being a very healthy tree and a crown class of five being dead with four being really, really sick. And you can see that in our sites, the mature trees were very, very unhealthy with an average of about three, around 3.5, which is a pretty sick ash tree. The saplings in the site were much, much more healthy. And we found that the, even though the saplings were dying, uh, even, even if you look just at dead trees, most of the dead big trees had died because of EAB, whereas most of the smaller saplings had died from something else. They were not, in fact, infested with EAB. And of course, sap, all saplings don't survive. You know, you only get a cohort that become big trees. So... My colleague Tim Morris um, in New York, he was a grad student uh, with Melissa Ferkey, and he started looking at some at what was happening in some of these sites. And these are sites with biocontrol agents released in about 2011 and 12. Um, and during the early days, we we went and looked at the ash health data. Again, a tree class classification of the crown of one is really, really healthy and dead is five. And these were actually trees we marked. We marked the individual trees and followed them. And so you can see that a lot of the trees were still ones and twos, some threes, lesser numbers of fours, which were very sick and five that were dead. And here's what happened to those trees in the 2001 census. All of the trees that had been dead or dying were now dead by 2001, which is not surprising. Um, and most of the ones that were threes had died with some, you know, with a lesser amount of the two. And you still had, you know, trees that were living, uh, about 10% of them, um, they were still living. They had been ones when the project started and they were still in the category one. But if you break this down, uh, we have differences between Eastern and Western New York and between large and small trees. Most of the small trees in Western New York had, had survived. The majority of them that were classified as one were still one uh, almost 10 years later. Um, and most, and a um, large proportion of the saplings in Eastern New York also were still alive. And even in Western New York, you still had a lot of the big trees that were still alive even after 10 years. So that's what's happening to the trees that were already there. And another thing we did was we went and took transects and looked at seedlings, which were counted as zero to five meters tall, Sa and then small saplings and larger saplings over a meter in height. And there was a lot of variability in the numbers in each category, but we found there was no significant difference between the number of trees in each category in 2014 and 2021. The exception was in Eastern New York, and there was a significant increase in so tall saplings that were over a meter tall. But the fact that the very smallest seedlings were still present at these sites shows there had to be reproducing ash at these sites because ash, seedling, ash seeds do not live very long in the soil. And so even 10, you know, this was, uh, I guess, seven years later, we really saw no difference in the regeneration of ash at these sites, which is very good news. Um, and what another study that we did was to see if we could actually release parasitoids in what we called these aftermath forests. This is a typical picture in New York where 
you have lots and lots of mature ash trees and they just all died. Um, but you've got an understory. And the question is, can you release parasitoids into a situation where the big trees have died? EAB is at very low density because the population's crashed because its food is gone. And can you release parasitoids into this situation? And what we found was, is that not only can we release parasitoids into this, but the impact they have on EAB populations is the same as the impact at sites where the parasitoids had been around for a decade. So um, this is really great news because there are a lot of these aftermath forests throughout the country. And um, it's, it's really wonderful that, um, that we now have this tool at our disposal and can release in a lot more sites. So my, my final um, section is going to be on integrating IPM, integrating biocontrol with the use of pesticides in an IPM program in urban forests. We wanted to know, can insecticides save these large ash trees while the parasitoid populations take their time to establish and disperse and increase? And if we do suppress EAB populations, will that allow the parasitoids to increase more quickly relative to their host? And can we eventually stop using these insecticides because the biocontrol agents and native natural enemies will cause sufficient mortality so we can stop treating the trees? And we found that uh, Tetrasticus planiponesi, Spathius galeni, and Oolbius agrilli established in all three cities where we did the study. We were studying it in Syracuse, New York, Naperville, Illinois, and Boulder, Colorado. Um, both uh, Tetrasticus planiponesi and Spathius galeni increased in density. They dispersed widely. Um, we put out what we call these sentinel logs, which are logs full of EAB, and they were attacked at high rates by both parasitoids. Uh, when we cut down branches, we found that parasitism by Tetrasticus and woodpeckers was very high, and the EAB density in these sites fell to below 10 larvae per meter squared. You see, you see I keep bringing up that 10. That seems to be um, where these parasit natural enemies are driving EAB to below that 10, um, 10 larvae per meter squared threshold. So in 2019, we actually um, stopped insecticide treatment in our short-term treatment trees. These are trees that we are now going to see um, what happens. We expect the EAB density to stay low and the ash trees to stay healthy because of the action of parasitoids, but time will tell. Um, and so we decided, you know, it's hard. One doesn't want to go out and treat every tree in a forest. But there are circumstances where you might want to save some reproductively important trees or, you know, there's ash trees that are very important to, let's say, native tribes because they make baskets and you need ash for baseball bats. So it's important to keep some large trees alive for seed production because of this short life expectancy of seeds in the soil. And then, you know, ash trees can take 30 to 40 years to reach maturity. So we're transferring what we know about urban IPM to forest settings. Um, and, and we hope that it is as successful as our project in the urban areas. So I just would like to wrap up by kind of giving some conclusions from this 20 years of work that we've been doing. Um, we've found that EAB parasitoids are establishing really well, especially in the north. Uh, we're looking at the intricacies of the impact across climate zones in the U.S. I have a new project that's looking at it from northern Duluth down to southern Missouri and looking at parasitoid uh, persistence. Uh, the parasitoids are dispersing well from release sites um, to protect ash from EAB throughout localized areas. After release, even though many of the mature trees do die, survival of EAB in regenerating ash, oh, I said survival was low. It's, oh yes, that's correct. Survival of EAB in regenerating ash is very, very low compared to the, um, due to the combined action of released parasitoids and woodpeckers. 
Um, and we've shown promise of integrating biocontrol with insecticide treatments, both in urban and forest settings, and releasing parasitoids in areas where EAB has already killed many of the mature trees is another promising strategy for protecting this next generation of ash trees. So um, as, I, as I head towards retirement, I'm very happy to say that this project seems to be going very well and um, really hope that ash can be an important part of our forests in the years to come. And I'd like to thank my coworkers um, who have kept me sane during COVID uh, while we've all been locked down. And um, I don't know if uh, Robin wants me to answer questions, but that's all I have for today. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you, Julie. Um, I am not seeing any questions right now. Um, if folks, if you have a question, please uh, feel free to quickly um, put it in the chat or the Q&A pod. But um, I have to say, this is a lot of information that, that I have not heard. So it was good to hear. I especially was interested in those dispersal slides with the tetrasticus and, and that kind of thing, because I hadn't heard how well that does. And that, that was really a good illustration on that really helps out a lot. So um, that and everything else. OK, so uh, we do have a question. Um, from M. Roberts, have there been parasitoid releases in Oregon yet? If not, are there plans to release parasitoids in Oregon soon? Thank no you and for yes. the informative webinar. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> yes, the the Department of um, I don't know who exactly got the grant, but um, there's a something called PPA seven seven two one, which is the Plant Protection Act. And Oregon applied for and got funds to do biocontrol of EAB in Oregon. So they have the funding and they are gearing up to do that this year. Well, that's good to know. We're getting, um, we've gotten a lot of interest and information, um, of course, from our folks in Oregon because of that find, those finds that they're, they had. So um, again, it's kind of, it gets to be a surprise a little bit when here it is out on the West Coast and you know, in between, we haven't seen it yet. So, but um, I just want to say thanks again, Julie. This you always you are always a great presenter as far as giving us new and interesting information and kind of giving us a big picture of what's going on. So I always appreciate that when you're able to come on and do that. Um, we do have a question from Sean. How well does EAB survive in ash with a DBH of ten inches or less? And would treating the smaller trees be effective along with injections to save the smaller trees? Um, I don't know anything about injecting smaller trees. I don't know if they have a, I have no idea if they have a critical size that you can, you know, uh, treat below. Um, I'm not really familiar with that. I do know that they treat, you know, every so many inches. Um, I don't know about uptake of the product in the smaller trees, um, but EAB can certainly survive. I even, you know, the, the conventional wisdom is that EAB cannot survive in a tree below one inch, like they won't attack a tree below, I mean, yeah, below one inch, which is about two and a half centimeters. I have seen trees with EAB exit holes that are as small as 1.4 centimeters, which is really tiny. So yes, EAB can certainly um, survive in the smaller trees. If the parasitoids are around, Tetrasticus planopanisi prefers to attack EAB in the smaller trees, and they do a really good job of it. Um, but I don't know about treating them. I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Yeah, you know, that might be more better covered by a tree service or someone, you know, a, a city forester or or area forester, I think, would probably be have a better idea. Most of them are pretty well versed on that by now, I think, as, as far as, you know, people, homeowners and woodland owners now. They, so that might be an idea. Um, <clears throat> I think that unless there's more questions pop up, here we go. Oh, it says, so biocontrol along with injecting might be a good method, Sean says. Yes, but biocontrol is not a technique that 
homeowners can use. They need to work with usually governmental entities of some sort. We, we don't release parasitoids on private property generally because they're less, you know, once you release parasitoids, it takes time and you have to keep the EAB around. That's just how this works. And, you know, we can't um, be sure that homeowners aren't going to decide the next year, oh my goodness, they're all dying, all the trees are dying, let's cut them all down. So we don't, and the parasitoids are very expensive to rear. I mean, it's it's quite diff. I mean, it's difficult. It's doable, but you know, each one of them is very expensive to produce. And so we need to make sure that we put them in places where they are very likely to have a stable habitat for some time to come before they can build up and disperse. So we we don't release on on private property. You know, that's, that is a good, that was a good question and a good answer because I do get questions about that often from the eab.info website, you know, where can I get parasitoids and who, how much are they? That's kind of some of the things that well, sir, questions sir, that I get, what, so. what homeowners can yeah. do is they can lobby their municipalities or somebody to find a good site, you know, oftentimes, even in an urban area, you'll have a creek running through the, the, through the town or something, and there's lots of ash, and the EAB is in there, but there's regeneration, that would be a great place to release it, and, uh, you know, work with your municipalities to get the, you know, to encourage them to release the parasitoids. Oh, and that's, that's you know, lobby, lobbying is something that homeowners can do. Yeah. Well, I am, that's a good, that is a good, good way to put it, because I had not even considered that before as far as giving folks an answer like that. So I'll keep that in one in mind for sure. Um, M says, did I understand correctly that injections and parasitoids can be used in tandem? Do the insecticides have negative impacts on the parasitoid populations? For clarity, if an infect, infested ash has been injected and the EAB feeds on it, and then parasitoids, parasitoids feed on EAB in the same tree, will both EAB and the parasitoids die? I think you discussed this. I just want to make sure my facts are straight, she says. I did not, I did not discuss that. It is a great point. And um, absolutely, they are compatible. It's really wonderful. So the 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 insecticides are usually injected and then taken up, you know, under the bark. So the egg parasitoid, which is attacking EAB on the outer bark, is not going to be affected. And the way the parasitoid finds the EAB larva is it hears it feeding. So when the EAB are chewing on the bark, they're creating vibrations or noise, sound, sound they're vibrations of some sort. That's how the parasitoids find them. So if the EAB is dead, the parasitoids will not find it uh, because they will not hear it. And we have absolutely, in our urban study, found trees that were injected. You know, the, the pesticide doesn't, um, it doesn't get taken up 100% and go to every single nook and cranny of the tree. So even though on our treated trees, we don't find a lot of EAB, we absolutely do find EAB and they are parasitized and the parasites are fine. So they are totally compatible um, for being used together. Okay, that's interesting. Especially if they find it by vibration, that's interesting. Yeah, they're just walking around um, on the on the bark, you know, using their feet and antennae to look for feel for that vibration. Fascinating how the natural world works. You know how these things evolve and, and figure out how to survive and thrive and that kind of thing. It's amazing. I'm always kind of uh, interested in those things anyway. Okay, folks. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. You will be getting an email tomorrow if you think of something you would like to ask Julie Gould, and you'll have her con we have her email address if so if you have questions and also a survey, like I said before. I want to thank you again, Julie. Always good to have you on EAB University. And 
Thank you everyone for participating. And um, this recorded webinar will be on the eab.info website on the EAB University page uh, later on this week. So thank you so much for everyone and have a great day. Thanks, Robin.